Good evening, everybody. We probably all know each other on this call, but if, if you don't, um, I'm Ed Cesar, uh, chair of the New York Yacht Club Rating and Measurement Rule Committee, um, joined by Larry Fox, who serves on both the New York and Storm Trisel Rating Rule Committees, uh, and Chris Tetmark, uh, principal rating officer at U.S. Sailing. I'm not, I may have butchered your title there, Chris, but um, Chris is the man. Uh, this is the third in our series uh, of ORC educational uh, seminars. Um, if you missed the first two, they are available to be viewed on recording. Um, and I think if you put your name in the Q&A, we will make sure that you get uh, the flyer that has links to both the recordings and the final session coming up in April. So as Tim put uh, up in the beginning as a housekeeping matter, uh, we're very much looking forward to questions this evening in a, in a conversant and, and dynamic way. So please do put your questions in the Q&A. Chris will monitor that. Some will take in real time and some will save for our Q&A session at the end. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you put your email address in the Q&A, we'll make sure you get the deck and the flyer that has the links to the recordings and the April session. So with that, we'll, we'll get started. And, and this deck is pretty short. Um, we really wanna keep this quite interactive this evening. I think it's the best format for this piece of the, of the syllabus, if you will. Um, just to review a little bit of which was in previous seminars, um, the ORC is a VPP-based rule. Uh, VPP stands for Velocity Prediction Program, which is a computer program that takes the characteristics of the boat and the characteristics of the conditions the boat may sail through and predicts how fast it should go. Simple as that. And the VPP works by using a set of proprietary algorithms to predict the speed of the boat through the water. Um, and it predicts that speed, and this is important, for a full matrix of wind speeds and wind angles. Gets a little complicated pr pretty quickly, doesn't it? Boat's performance characteristics against a full spread of wind speeds and wind angles. In addition to that, one needs to consider which sails are up. Um, so wind conditions, sail inventory, the basic configuration of the boat's hull, which is provided by an offset file, which is a rendering of the boat from the designer's office or a scan done by your measure. Those are the three inputs, if you will, to the VPP. Now, they produce a polar diagram, an example of which you see here on the right. I'll talk about that in one second. Uh, but the polar diagram portrays the speed uh, of the boat at each one of the wind speed and true wind angles. Two things people often ask, is the VPP accurate? And I, and I think the answer to that question um, is it is more than accurate enough to provide good racing. Uh, and it's getting more accurate all the time. As an example of that, I'd point to this VPP diagram, the polar diagram, and notice the colors on each of the polar curves, which can plot the speed and angle of, of the boat. Uh, and each of those colors represents a different sail in place. So the ORC rule and the VPP are becoming more and more sophisticated about using and detailing each of the variables that go into the performance of the boat. Um, that dynamic continuing improvement, I think is something that um, speaks well to the intentions and capabilities of the ORC home office, if you will. So, the VPP does all of this and gives us a polar diagram. We now need to think about how to use that in scoring a race. And I think one thing I hope everybody takes away from this evening is that we had a single number rule back under the IRC, which assumed a equal spread of wind angles and wind speeds. And as the old saying goes, every dog would have her day. And those boats that did well in one condition might not do so well in another. We now move to a multi-number system, which strives to rate 
with much more fidelity how your boat's going to do in the conditions for the race that day. So the scoring is only going to be as accurate as the ability of the scoring option to reflect with fidelity the conditions that the boat actually sailed through during the race. A pretty tall order, but I think we're finding that we're getting closer and closer to capturing that fidelity and improving it with more resolution. And I think it's very important to keep in mind that we mustn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And the good is getting better all the time. So Larry, let's go to the next slide. So um, what we're looking at here is two, two pieces side by side. On the left, you're looking at the projected speeds, the polar speeds, from the VPP. So the VPP is the program that generates projected speed. The polar speed are the speeds it creates, right? Um, and then we're looking at that converted into rating numbers, time allowances per second. And one of the important things to understand about the ORC it is not only is the, the VPP an objective thing doing scientific work, but even the ratings themselves are objective facts. When you see a rating of 560.2, that's how many seconds it would take you to sail a mile in those conditions. Most other ratings started trying to do that and gave up on it. So o ORC is pretty sophisticated when it comes to that. And this example is, is for a J88, uh, sorry, J80. Um, and I, I believe we're still looking at last year's numbers, but the new VPP. Um, uh, we'll update the deck with the new VPP and the new numbers, new rating certificate, so that and that we have those available um, and, and and publish it in that form. So that that's the distinction between the polar speeds and the ratings. Now, if we take that a step further, and we say, how do we get from that polar speed its seconds per mile equivalents? How do we get for that from rate to ratings? And I like to think of that as, as really three key steps that we talk about. Um, the first is to talk about what kind of wind strengths are going to use. There's single number, there's triple number, which is, is fading a little bit this year with the advancement of five band, more, uh, more precision in the, in the, in the, um, the narrowness or, or width of the uh, of the of the true wind speeds. Um, second thing we have to talk about is what's the course configuration. We have windward lured courses. We have provision for windward lured courses where it's three beats and two and two runs. So that's a 60-40 windward lured. And then we have an array of, of, of predominant courses, upwind, reaching, and downwind. We'll talk about those. Um, and then, of course, we have the all-purpose. And what is all-purpose? It's just an equal distribution of true wind angles. If the wind were out of the north and you sailed in a circle, the all-purpose rating would be the, the one that would fairly rate how you just sailed. Um, or, Larry, if you sailed in Bermuda and the wind went right through the compass rules and all the way back, <laughs> it would be the same thing. Yes. And there was that famous around uh, Great Britain and Ireland race, but we'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, so um, we have the approach we're taking to the wind and our selection. We have the, the nature of the course, and now we extrapolate from the VPP all those little components and add them up into a composite rating for that individual condition. And so it, you you can kind of see how this comes together. The VPP is doing the full array, but we're inserting a matrix of true wind speeds and true wind angles to tell the VPP what to pull out and construct a rating with. And that's what your rating in windward, lured, medium strength means. All in an effort to, re to score the boat as closely as we can against the conditions she actually sailed through. And so you can see here the five band wind, um, wind strength weightings 
these are going to be consistent across all five band ratings. And just a plug for ORC. Uh, they did this for us. No one else in the world uh, outside of North America uses five band. Uh, we can talk about why that might be another time, but uh, it, it's it's really just a measure of their support for us that they've done this. And I think, Larry, w w one thing to mention about the five bands, two things to mention, is uh, one of the cogent um, observations slash complaints about the VPP rating, the ORC, is, gee, it, it, it doesn't treat planning boats fairly. Um, ORC says, yes, it does. The, the, the VPP sees where the boat gets on the step. Um, it's hard to reflect that exact moment in time in a rating, but the five bands have smoothed each of the bands and its borders, so it helps with that, number one. Number two, we've heard from many race officers who were trepidatious about five bands saying, oh, it's too hard to use. They found just the opposite. It's much easier to use because very often when you get out there, your observations tell you you were somewhere in between low, medium, and high. And now with low, medium, and high, medium, ah, I've I found my band for today's conditions. I just want to pick up on a question uh, that Lou has just asked um, re regarding uh, when you select this. And we can talk about this more, more later on. But as a general rule of thumb, uh, race committees, certainly at the Storm Trisail Club and at the New York Yacht Club, uh, attempt to announce their intended scoring option, uh, at least by the uh, warning signal for class. Right, so, so you know going into the race what, what rating you're using. And we'll look at something you can do to help yourself with that a little bit. Uh, the ORC rule does provide, however, that if the, the conditions materially change, the race committee can revisit that decision later on. And at that point, most race committees take the point of view that if they're going to make a change, they're going to do it before the first boat finishes. Uh, and the last thing I'll tell you about that is that the um, while the redress is a powerful tool, it is never going to be applicable here. Race committees do a really good job of picking the right uh, rating option for an instant race, and it, it's 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 something they'd rather uh, be drinking at the bar than discussing in a, in the protest room. So that we we rule that out. Um, yeah. and, and I mean, I think almost every regatta does at this point. And that, yes, that's a function of the race documentation. I think you'll find that almost every race committee now dictates that choice of wind ban is not a matter for redress. So let's talk a little bit about the certificate and, and what's on it. Um, a lot of rating options, as you saw. Um, all purpose um, it is often used to put boats into classes. There are other methods to do that, and, and we're exploring always additional methods to do that. Some clubs use CDL, which is uh, the it's sort of an effective waterline weight length for upwind sailing. Um, and, and you'll see that in, in a lot of ORC regattas. Um, others use all-purpose ratings, and it's a question of, of, of how you think classes break best, decision of each OA individually. So windward lured, equal upwind downwind, right? Four leg, two leg, six leg applies equally to all of them. 60-40 is really just for a three and two in practical terms. All-purpose is a good rating assumption if you're sailing a point-to-point -point race or um, a, a tour of the harbor kind of race where you're gonna be doing all sorts of different things and, and trying to assess how they're gonna perform on average is not the right thing to do in that race. Single, triple, and five band. What's the best way to go? And I guess this is, this is really a comment for race committees. We'll look a little later about how you relate race committee experience, race committee tools to how you make these kinds of selections. My rule of thumb would be to say, uh, experience has told us, and by, by experience, I mean the last year, has told us that five band is not only fairer for the competitors, but it's easier for the OAs to administer. And so we're practical. 
I think five band is a really good choice. Sometimes it's just not practical. Sometimes your forecast is going to be all over the map. You're selling the Block Island race or the Vineyard race or the Ida Lewis distance race. And you're going to have all sorts of conditions and it doesn't lend itself to any one thing. When you face that, the all-purpose rating becomes a really good option. And you can now do that in, com in combination with single wind strength, triple number for those ranges, which by the way, exclude 24 knot, or five band, which give you the full range and the table for those matrices, um, excuse me, are in the deck. So we'll show you that. ORC also goes a step further. Well, actually they go three steps further. They provide for a customized rating. Folks out in Chicago are well aware of the predominant wind conditions for Chicago Mac. And it has a few different flavors. It can be pri primarily a, you know, a reaching and a, a running race, a reaching race, or, or a beating race. And so there are different rating um, mat wind matrices for, to generate ratings for that race that can be selected by the OA uh, shortly before the race. So I, I'd have to ask Matt the exact timing of it. Uh, so you can have the the specificity of known conditions to the extent that those conditions are knowable. And I, I would emphasize there is no such thing as a VPP rating that is not um, ultimately the result of a wind matrix. To the extent that the wind matrix aligns with the weather you experience, that's going to be a pretty good rating for that race. To the extent that it doesn't, it's going to leave some things um, to chance. And that's where the race committee coming back in and perhaps changing it after the fact um, can make a lot of sense. Um, customized raising is something we'll go into in much more detail at our next session in April. Um, and we'll also cover in that session uh, PCS or performance score, uh, performance curve scoring. Uh, constructed course, which is another unique facility of, of the ORC rule, uh, exclusive to the ORC rule, I should add. Um, and, and finally, um, a, a new uh, creation this year of weather routing scoring uh, that, that we'll talk about, and that'll be applicable not under the ORC rule, but it'll be applicable to the Bermuda race. And under the ORC rule, it will be applicable to ORC worlds in Newport this October. So um, if you're interested in that, please please join us in April. Larry, I just want, we want to handle one question from Commodore Zapatakis uh, for, uh, on the on the five band. The yeah. question, is it not true that the challenge with the five band is that it is imperative that the RC measure and record the actual percentage of wind speeds during the entire race? I would say um, yes and no, right? Yeah, that's, that's an ideal scenario. And to the extent that one has those capabilities, that's a great thing. Um, but you you also have as a race committee. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, but except um, as you have pointed out, it is ORC orthodoxy and best practices to try and announce the wind band prior to the warning gun. Ah, so yeah. that 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 puts the the onus on the race committee to mind their forecasts, look at sail flow, look at predict wind, stick their thumb in the air. I'm not kidding. Stick their thumb in the air, see if there are white caps, and yeah. make the best determination they can. I suppose in a perfect world, the race could be might monitor actual conditions all the way around from mark boats and see how well they did, and then make a decision about changing. But two things: hard for most race committees to have those assets, and second, I think race committees find that it needs to be a big miss if they're going to change. Yeah. I would absolutely concur with the last point. If you're close, even if you think you're on the wrong side of the line, I, I would certainly counsel not to change. And um, leave it to me to bring Hegel into uh, a discussion of rating rules. But um, the 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 situation Commodore Zevatakis describes is, is really the dialectic of this whole scenario. On the one hand, uh, Yes, 
if we wait to the end, we have more information, perfect or not. On the other hand, most competitors really want to be able to assess how they're doing. You're around that last windward mark. Are you, are you going after a guy? Are you splitting with him? What are you doing? Part of that is your perception of you're beating him or he's beating you on corrected time. Um, so I, I guess, um, I, I you know, I would come back to airing on doing the best job we can up front and changing when we have to at the back end. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the thing. The other thing I'd say, just for race committees generally, the two most useful observations you can make before the start are the white caps or not, and which side of the boat people are hiking in. If everybody's <laughs> sitting to leeward, that's going to tell you a lot. All right, that's you kind of got people scattered. That too, you know. That's above our pay grade, Larry. Next slide. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um. So, what's on your certificate? And um, ORC is 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 moving forward so quickly; it's hard for us to keep our materials up to date. Uh, we added a uh, five band windward lure back in twenty two. We added predominantly reaching as a third version of the predominant course orientations last year. And the uh, some of the percentages on that have changed. We'll look at that later on. Um, and, and this year we're adding five band for the predominant ratings, uh, which, which is um, a, a request we had based on the success of five band with Lured from race committees that felt they couldn't get the right call exactly with just a triple number or a single number. So you'll see a section for single numbers, time on distance, time on time. The rules, because of the nature of the rule, the, the VPP calculates in, in a sense of time on distance. Time on time is just an arithmetic uh, calculation Convert. on that. You will see five bands for a lot of options, more than just the windward lured here. You will see five bands for predominance. You will see um, single numbers for predominance as well. And you will also see an array of custom course configurations. In the US, that's Chicago Mac, it's Bayview Mac, it's the Harvest Moon, it's Victoria Maui. All of those will be there. Um, and I think there's been um, relatively little change of the wind matrices behind those ratings for this year. But that's something we we can confirm back to you. Um, talked about how do how do you know where you are? So one of the things we put together for for storm trisol members for some of our regattas is a, a, a sheet, and this is kind of an image of how it's generated. But we give the competitors a, a package of sheets, so when they say, "Hey, it's low medium windward lured," pull out that laminated sheet. And now you, you kind of know where you are just by gauging them, you know, 25 minutes in a, into a race, that's the 10 plus the 15 column. Here's where I am to another boat in my class. Now I can make a tactical decision of what I might want to do based on corrected time. So a lot of forms of doing this. There's some stuff that'll come right off the ORC website. It, it does this for you. Um, Trying to have, uh, you know, I guess my counsel to everyone would be as a competitor is have a set of laminated cards on your boat for each rating option for each each regatta you sail in. You know, just update them with the, with the boats in your class so you know where you are and, and you don't have to think about it. And as a navigator, I really don't like them, um, like when people start yelling and I don't have answers. So, um, Ed, this. This slide was something we created to, to address sort of the continuum of capabilities. And it kind of comes back to, to what the Commodore was was mentioning. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the range of, um, of, of capability and what you might do with that? Yeah, I, I think um, not to get into the race committee is knitting too much, as I mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago. But uh, I, think, I think as you get to the race course, one will find that the choice of scoring course configuration and wind matrix, those are the two things that, that compose the scoring system, 
are going to depend on a couple of things. It's going to depend on, is it, well, obviously there's a buoy race. Um, is it an odd number of laps or an even number of laps within that? And, or, or, or is it a government mark navigator course? Um, th those are the, those are the big things that will determine which configuration is going to be used. Uh, and, but then there are also, um, what kind of equipment does the race committee have? There's a little bit of a cultural approach to, um, which, when, which, when strength matrices we're going to use. Um, so it, it, um, it, 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 it depends on a number of factors, what you're going to find posted when you get to the race course. What, what have I missed about that, Larry? No, I, I think that's basically right. And I think, it, you know, people, people overcomplicate this enormously. You know, um, one competitor said to me, um, well, you're not taking your wind readings at 10 meters, so they're wrong. Yeah, that's true. But there's a formula that converts wind readings at any height to wind meters readings at 10 meters. So you can approximate it pretty easily. Um, anybody who's ever, you know, um, tuned their instruments has done that. Yeah. Because your mass doesn't happen to be 10 meters high, typically. Um, so in the context of the information available, you, you make the best choice you can. And, you know, let's step yeah. back and say, why are we all doing this? We're doing this not only to provide for fair sailing, but to promote participation and competition. The committees are pretty good, like the rest of us, at reading their local fleet and making appropriate decisions based on the expectations of that fleet and trying to give them a great racing experience. Yeah. That's really what this is. To, to expand on that, Larry, just a little bit, we had a question in the chat about the race committee doesn't always realize they need to adjust the wind strength uh, to account for the fact that model data is at 10 meter wind height well i think what is apropos there is we mustn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good if the race committee were going to make an adjustment for height above water of wind strength they would need to do it for every boat in the fleet right um so yeah model winds are at 10 meters um that's more fidelity than i think we can expect or frankly need in adjusting the ratings. And, and, and just to put that in mathematical perspective, Ed, if you had um, your wind instruments at a, at a height of about 67 feet, the difference from 10 meters is 11%. So we're not- Which talking. for you expedition users is a lot. And I would encourage you as you navigators yeah. out there to remember to adjust an expedition for your own mass height. Yeah, I, I'm not saying it's not important, but the difference at 11% between 20, if you have 20 knots is what, 22? It's, you know, it's, we, we can, we can be, be doing overkill on this very quickly. Um, there was another question, um, I think Hero asked um, about uh, what happens if one class starts and it's 10, and by the time you get to the last class, it's 25. And, and like every question, the answer is always starts with it depends. If you're attempting to score a fleet, you've you've got an interesting problem that's hard to solve. But if you're not worried about fleet, if you're just looking at each class unto itself, and you're going to choose an overall winner based on how each boat performed relative to its class, then you have no problem saying, okay, that first class started in medium. And the second class or the last class started in heavy. And there's nothing wrong with that. And committees do that all the time. Well, but they don't frequently, Larry, choose different wind bands for different classes. Yeah. Words. So you, yeah. I, I you know, if wind changes, I mean, I see that I see that plenty. But it it is contingent, as I say, yeah. on you're not looking for an overall winner on one scoring. Yeah. Doing that, you can't do it. So I think here, my answer to your question would be that's eh, sailboat racing, <laughs> and and the committee, based on the conditions you describe, may elect to kind of average it out and change the band at the end of the race before the last boat finishes, or it may not. But 
um, we mustn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I will also say that PCS addresses some of this problem. And that's all I'm going to say until April 10th. Right. And here, I would tell you that um, ORC is every bit as effective as, let's say, IRC in predicting things for, say, 50 knots and six knots of current against you. So um, for, for your experiences uh, with that as well. Um, OK, so we said ORC has been incredibly responsive. Uh, let's go through some of the things they've done to improve the VPP and the rule for this year. So a residuary resistance model. Residuary resistance is the part of the resistance that you don't think about. It, it's not the friction of the boat through the water. It's the other stuff. And so the physics of that and the computer code around that was 10 years old. And this year, they updated it to a much more sophisticated model that modern computers can run. When the last version of that was, was created, it respected the limitation of some of the computers. The depowering scheme. Now, those of you who, who are as old as I am may remember the, the speed packs we got with IOR rules back in the early 80s. And they had a column on the far right called flat. And that comment, column is still there by the way, in, in, in the speed pack. And what flat said is, is okay, we all had flattening reefs then in our mainsails. And at some point you started whaling on that, kind of like your Cunningham, but an industrial strength Cunningham, because sails were less, less rigid. What the VPP is doing now is like three steps more sophisticated. It's looking at the reality that you go from a light one to an H1 to a three, which is not just smaller sail area, it's flatter sails. And it's accounting for the reality of when you would do that. Because at the heart of this model is kind of a balance of forces. It's finding a, 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 a static situation where you can resolve the boat's forward speed as a result of all the other forces quantified at that moment. That's, that's the basis of what the model's doing. So the depowering scheme is simply taking that a few, few more steps forward now with greater sophistication and, and precision. Um, weather routing scoring, we will talk about um, in, in, um, in April, but in essence, this is a way to use um, a weather forecast and grid model and routing software to calculate an optimized rating and then sail under those ratings. None of us know how that's going to work, but we're all going to learn this year. Um, and we'll come back to that in April in, in much more detail. Um, at, at, as one of the things we requested, we were very happy to see the addition of a 24 knot wind band to the VPP this year. Difference between 20 and 24 means a lot. Um, for, for a lot of boats, and having that is a big plus. Um, the options for North America, we do, we've talked about all of the scoring options, but just adding those four ups, right? Wasn't um, most of the rest of the world doesn't use triple number or uh, five band. So this was really um, an acknowledgement of, of the North American market and ORC's desire to support. Um, minimum crew weight. There's some technical distinctions on what you can do with this. Uh, the important thing to note about minimum crew weight is it has to be invoked in the NOR. So when you read your NOR, if it is invoked, you want to pay some attention to it. Um, there was um, an inconsistency between rules of IRC and ORC in particular on whether you could um, fly a headsail in tandem with a spinnaker without a handicap adjustment. The problem was that there were races being run that were using both rules and boats were getting disqualified for doing what one rule allowed as opposed to the other. Um, and there were big races. So uh, that's been resolved and it, it's now consistent across both rules. 
Um, and lastly, uh, the mass jack pump, um, which is, um, we all know that you can adjust the tension on your rig with a mass jack and you can do it during a race. Um, and that's an advantage and the ORC rule now accounts for it. So just a few things that we're looking at going forward. Um, and, and I feel really good about these because a lot of these have to do with things we did recommend as a New York and Stone Tricycle Club. Uh, looking at the whole asymmetric wardrobe. Well, one of the challenges um, that any rule has um, is looking at a flat reaching sail. And there are two reasons it's problematic. One is because your mast and your rigging get in the way of sheeting the sail at some point. And second is anyone who's ever sailed with a code type sail appreciates that there's an absolute limit in any given wind strength on how tight you can carry it. Right? And so looking at, and the rule has started to look at in past years, code sails and how tight can I carry them and, and what that adds, those sails are rated separately. The rule picks or the VPP picks the best performance of a sail at a particular uh, intersection of true wind speed and true wind angle, but it is calculating independently for every viable sail combination. That's how it does it. Yeah. Um, so this is taking it a step further because right now what an A3 is, is just a small A2. But with this, your A3 can do things your A2 can't. And it will, will or ORC is looking at how to account for it. Ed, you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to simplify it, Larry, for the rest of us history majors and <laughs> say that in it, the rule and the ORC are moving things forward. So they are now not only taking into account the size of the sail, but the flying shape of the sail. Yeah, fair enough. Um, the second part of that, item two here, it is the force model and the mid girth ratio. So uh, this really speaks to the rig and how the sail is cut to wrap around the shrouds. Right. And so what the research project ORC has taken onto itself is to understand how that shape affects the polar speeds and then reflect that back into the rule. And it's really kind of cool when you see how the ORC ITC, the, 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 uh, the technical committee, how they work. They don't start by tinkering with the rule. They start by doing aerodynamic and hydrodynamic research, and they do a lot of it. And when they realize, okay, we can quantify how this affects a VPP, then they add it to the rule. Um, and and that's, that's a really good way to do develop. Um, further updates to the flattening force model. We talked about this, but they're not done. It's gonna be stage by stage. Uh, Everyone knows that you can look at two code zeros that kind of are the same orientation, but they're cut a little different. And one is faster than the other, right? How to understand that and relate that back into the rule. Uh, there's some revisions for boats that now have electrical uh, propulsion as opposed to fuel-based propulsion. And it has to do with how you measure and, you know, you're not putting diesel in a tank anymore. So we're, we're you know, that's a little bit different. Um, there's a thought that the predicted heel angle and the, the VPP predicts your heel angle. It's one of the forces that's getting balanced, if you will. There's a thought that we may be able to improve how we do that. And, and the experimental method that ORC ITC has taken is they're gonna measure heel, heel angle and compare it to the predicted heel angle and look at, is there a way to tweak that and make that more precise? Um, and then uh, they're looking again at um, provisions regarding uh, manual versus stored power, right? You know, if, if I have electrical winches or if I, I have winches that allow me to build up uh, reserve power, what, what, what does that mean? So I'd hope you take it you take away a couple of things from this. One is just how sophisticated this model already is and how much more sophisticated it's becoming. And 
Second, the level of detail the ITC and the ORC generally are willing to go to to make this the the um, the foremost VPP based rule um, in the world, uh, and I think that's that's notable. It, yeah, one, one, one comment and one question really for both of you guys. The comment is that, as Larry points out, the ITC is very receptive to formal submissions made, made by by Congress representatives to each nationality. Uh, the U.S. has four delegates, Chris, right now to, to, to Congress. Um, based on fleet size, we are the fastest growing ORC fleet in the world. Um, very receptive to formal submissions made through the Congress and observations and questions and gripes from owners. Um, what they continue to emphasize, I think justifiably is, you gotta come with some data. You can't just tell me, hey, I'm not being treated fairly. You have to come with some data. So um, I offer that. My question is, I know they're doing this, but how are they addressing obvious anomalous outliers that seem to have a rating that doesn't yeah. reflect how fast the boat's going? There are a couple of pieces of that. Um, the first thing is this notion of a test fleet. So ORC has a group of boats, a group of models of boats that uh, they constantly look at whenever they're preparing and testing and evaluating a proposed modification. What does it do to the relative ratings? Do these two boats get closer together or farther apart? If they're getting closer together, is that a desirable thing based on what we know experientially is going on? So part of it is upfront, they're doing this themselves with a representative sampling of boats of all, all sizes and shapes. And I, I think, I don't recall the exact number, but I want to say the test fleet is about two dozen different models. The second thing is, if I do, um, if I believe the rating treats me unfairly, and I have a tool like Expedition or Adrena on board, and I can capture my performance data and submit that to the ORC, they have an outside um, service they use. And they give them that data. They actually scrub the data to correct for the fact that maybe your instruments aren't tuned perfectly, which they can see in, in your data. And then they start saying, OK, how does your actual performance compare to your predicted performance? And from the test fleet, they already know kind of the, the, the range in which that's supposed to live. No one sails at 100% of their projected performance all the time, right? But they know what the range should be. And if you're way outside of that range, or even a little bit outside of that range, they look at it, and, and the question, it's not like some of the old rules where they just tweak your rating and call it a day. The question is why? And they start digging into what are each of the metrics about your boat and how the VPP is looking at those to understand what's off. Because the fix they make isn't just to slow down the Swan 45. It's to more fairly rate any boat under those parameters. And just, you know, real experience on the water is an irreplaceable factor in doing that. So that's what the ITC is trying to do. Um, there are surprisingly few submissions, I, I would observe. Um, but um, every time there's been one, they, uh, or every time there's been one with enough supporting data, they've actually gone after it and, and, and tried to look at it. Um, I guess one other thing I'd add to that, one of the sources of, of errors um, in ratings were bad, um, 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 I'm sorry, the name of the file when they measure, when they scan the boat, the- um, Offset file. The offset file. And, you know, particularly if you start modifying your boat um, or you have a really old boat and the lines from the designer's drawings aren't, aren't entirely clear. The subtle changes in shape in an offset file really impact the, um, the, uh, the VPP. 
And so I would tell you, if you think you have an unfair rating, particularly if you have a one-off boat, the best thing you can do is get a scanned offset file and see how that changes it. Because that's before you have to go in and change anything about your boat or your configuration or do the data or any of that stuff. That can often make a very significant difference. So um, I don't know if that's a full answer, Ed, but it's as much yeah, as- Yeah, um, one, one thing I wanted to point out um, is uh, we've been advised cogently that the test fleet that Larry was referring to consists of all two, all with greater than 2000 boats, all of which have an ORC fully measured I certificate. So the test fleet is huge. 2000 uh, models or 2000 boats? If that was Dobbs, he may be able to answer that. That was Dobbs and I'm sure he can. I, yeah, I, <laughs> the last thing I read, and I looked at the graph, there weren't that many on it. But, right. uh, In any event, the test fleet is robust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's one more thing I'd like to show people if, if we have a few moments. Um, when we publish this deck, you'll see a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, wind matrices. Um, but I, I want to pick on the predominance for a moment. Um, and it's kind of interesting how these are created. So what do we know about the predominance? We have two sets of inputs that, that are primary. The first set is, well, what's our five band true wind speed matrix? And that doesn't change. It's the same for when we're lured as it is for any of the predominance as it is for all purpose. But when we come to, um, and I apologize for a bad title there, but when we come to the, um, the predominant upwind reaching and downwind, we also introduce a static matrix of true wind angles for each of those three. So if I want to come up with what is the, the matrix for low medium windward lured, or in this case, low medium reaching, what I do is I multiply the true wind speed matrix for the true wind strength times the true wind angle matrix for the course orientation. And what I now have is a full matrix of true wind speed and true wind angle for that rating option. And if we look at one of those, uh, this is a, a predominantly upwind. And here's the low wind strength, which is an average true wind speed of 6.5 knots. And a footnote there, one of the most useful things for an, a race committee to have it at, it, at its hand is hey, what are the true wind speeds for, you know, the average true wind speed for each band? 6.5, 9, 12, 16, what is it? That's a really easy way to think about the options and not to try yeah. and think about all the math of the range. That's a great point. Um, and that's um, what we've advised race committees is, hey, just figure out the average for each of the bands and that's your target. Yeah. And we can get into so, more of how the bands are yeah. developed if you want. So Larry, go, go back to the, the angle matrix for one second. Yeah. First of all, I think you've got a, a missed title there. Right? This is five and sixty forty. Yeah, this that, is, was, uh, that was what I was apologizing. Yeah, for. that's just a bad title. I think yeah, that was bad title. people. But what I would point about the point out about the matrix is, yeah, okay. So predominant. This is true wind angle matrix for all predominant. Yes. So there's there's three matrices: one for upwind, one for reaching, one for downwind. They are independent of wind speed. So. Yeah. If I'm looking at downwind in, you know, about 12 knots, I'm going to take the medium line. Yeah. So hang on. That I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get to a simpler point, Larry. Sorry. Do you have a, a, a rendering here of just simply the wind angle matrix for predominantly for, for predominantly upwind? Yeah. I mean, just the wind angle. It's it's right yeah. here. Okay. That's what I thought. Oh, that's upwind, right? Yeah. So Upwind reaching downwind. Those are the three variants of the predominant courses. Ah, okay. So predominantly upwind anticipates that you'll spend 32% VMG up, 34% at 52 degree true wind angle, 15 at 90, and so on. Yeah. What I want to point out is only if you experience those specific 
percentages at the specific wind angles, will this do as much as it possibly can to rate you fairly? If you only have 15% beating upwind, then the fidelity to what you actually sailed through will begin to deteriorate. But it will also be far more accurate, if you will, than a single number system. Yeah. Mustn't and, let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And, and, and I'll give you a great example of that. Um, last year's Marblehead Halifax race. This is normally a running race, right? Every, everybody who's done it knows that. And this year, it was largely a reaching race, a uh, beating race, um, into wet, well up the Nova Scotia coast. And because of the rule they chose to use, they had no way to change to a predominantly upwind, which would have been a perfect way to rate that rate that race. Now, they'd be using ORC. They would have said, well, hell, we've used predominantly downwind every year for forever. And this year we're going to use predominantly upwind and we're going to let people know that the morning of the race and off we go. And it's a much fairer race. So these are really great tools not just for the, the race committee to set a good course, but for the, the competitors to all have a positive experience and not feel like they're fighting the rule the whole race. So it, this is just one example in here. And as you scroll through the deck, there are all the other examples. And I'll, I'll try and complete that before we publish it so that everything's in there. I could, if you go back to this a second, you could add windward lured and windward lured 6040 to this and you just have zeros in the middle three lines, right? And then it would be a complete representation of, of what we're doing. So, and that's what we've got in the deck. Yeah, that's what we've I, got. I'd love to open it up to questions and discussion, hear what's on people's minds. Agreed. Uh, we, if, if we're going to keep to an hour, which I think is a good idea, we've got five minutes. Or if we've done a perfect job and there are no questions. <laughs> I find when there are no questions, it means that we lost them. no one's been paying attention. Yeah. So that's when we pull out the blue books. Uh, question Hang coming on. up, how about current? So uh, ORC can deal with current, uh, and, and specifically, it can deal with current in a constructed course scoring uh, option, which we'll talk about in April. Uh, but the other thing you do to account for current is you go to time on time. So we all grew up in time on distance, particularly in perf. That's all there was for a long time. And somebody along the way, I, I wish I knew who to credit with the invention of time on time, but it's a person who should be acknowledged. Um, someone said, well, you know, in, in the entirely fair, because it's not just the wind that's changing, the current comes into play, particularly in lighter air. And if we had a way to relate our ratings to the amount of time it took us to sail the course and not its, its objective length, it would treat some of that more fairly. And in fact, it demonstrably does. So I think that's um, a second way to do it. Um, and um, I'll, I'll defer to Dobbs if there are others um, that, that I'm not, are not coming to mind at the moment. Chris, any comment on current? Well, so there's presently some, a lot of work underway as part of the weather more weather forecast scorings to incorporate current into that model as well. So it's its work is underway and, and ORC is studying it as the ways to more accurately and effectively incorporate it. And, and to be fair, um, in part, it already does that. Because any routing software, I mean, weather routing model requires the routing software. All routing softwares incorporate current. So they may be looking at how, but but that it can be done in those models is given. Um, you know, that's not going to be an option for most regattas this year, but it's something we're looking to for the future for sure. But I, I would start by going time on time if, if, if you know, if that were, if the concern is current, very little wind, time on time is the, is the first step. To answer Hero's questions about longer races, the answer is yes, they are more tricky to rate. Um, for 
a transoceanic race. Um, you know, I think I think probably your best choice today is all-purpose single number. Um, it is, after all, a transoceanic race, <laughs> so <laughs> conditions are going to be wildly variable. Um, we'll talk. Um, I don't think we want to say much about weather routing software. Um, my own personal opinion is, well, clearly uh, that's not going to be appropriate for a multi-digit day race. Um, but we'll um, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that in in uh, in April. I thought I saw a question from Lou uh, about competitors. Uh, yeah, I find I, I'm going to paraphrase that question. Oh, wait, here it is. Um, there, there was a question about scratch sheets. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, the the template I use is, is a simple thing that I built in Excel to look at the ratings, look at the rating option, you know, depending on what kind of equipment you have on board. If you have a laptop on the boat or if you have a, a pad on deck or, or even an iPad and can bring up an Excel model and click on the right tab, I, I think that's the, the easiest way. But to be clear about it, for every race, for every class, not only are the options different, but the boats you're competing against are likely different. And you don't want to have an encyclopedia of, you know, the thousand or two thousand boats that have ORC certificates in America. You want to have the eight guys you're sailing against today. And so there is a way to, to get a general picture of that off the ORC um, uh, website. Um, I like to do it in Excel and, you know, I have the, the versions available to me depending on what rule or what uh, scoring option the, the race committee selects for a given race. Um, and, and I find that to be uh, pretty workable. Um, and, it, you know, if if someone um, wishes, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll kind of help you sort out how you how you can do that with the tools you have available to you. Uh, and Chris, have you been able to capture the emails pe folks have been putting in the Q&A? We have them. Oh, great. Thank you, Tim. Tim Tim's got them. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tim. You're working late tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, and those emails, we will send the deck after we've cleaned it up a little bit. And also this PDF that you see on your screen now, which contains links to, it will contain links to all three of the first sessions, recordings of the first three sessions, and the link to join the April 10th webinar. So um, yeah, yeah, two, two quick things. I just saw one more question and two quick things we should add. Uh, first, um, there is a change this year. So as most of you know, uh, uh, ORC eliminated GPH, uh, which was not a particularly useful number, and replaced it with with um, uh, with the the um, um, the APH, right? Am I, am I yeah, that, that's the, correct, oh, Larry. Yeah. And as a result, the rule we had in the past that said, hey, if your GPH was under 560, you had to have a, an ORCI certificate, was no longer usable because there was no GPH. So we've moved that to a 500 APH as a cutoff. If you're 500 below, you got to have an ORCI certificate. And if you've modified the hull or its appendages, you have to have an RCI certificate. Um, if you're wondering how that affected the fleet, um, of like the thousand certificates that were out there last year, something like 15 moved one way or the other, and nine of them were FAR 395s. So if you think about where you sit in the rating world against the FAR 395, if, if, you're, if you're faster than that, you're going to need the RCI, and if you're not, you're probably not going to. But um, you know, that's that's a useful thing to look at. Um, okay. Any more questions? Um, someone's asking. Ed, heard there was going to be a computer scoring tool for race officers. Has been for a long time. Um, it is the. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to get the proper name of it, but it's the only way 
that you can actually use the constructed course mechanism. It's where you lay out truant angle and truant speed by leg of course, and it computes the ratings on the fly and does the scoring on the fly. Uh, if there's something in addition this year for race officers, um, which there may be, I don't know what it is, but do keep in mind that ORC interfaces almost seamlessly with yacht scoring. So if you're using yacht scoring, you just pick the, um, the, the scoring option for the race, the ratings get pulled in, you enter the elapsed time, it does everything else. Um, and it, it's, um, it's a pretty effective, um, effective tool for anyone who's using. I think uh, we very quickly replying to Steve Taft, has anyone spent any time talking to the Aussies about why they prefer IRC over ORC in GP racing? I think two things, Anglo, right? Uh, and secondly, that may be fading a little bit. I don't know. IRC is a good rule. It's not a multi-number rule, but it's a good rule. Um, I think the short answer to Steve's question is Anglo. Yeah, the other thing to observe there is, you know, if you're sailing a TP-52 regatta, IRC is a really effective rule because the boats are all so similar to each other. And, you know, when you're trying to sail with large fleets, diverse fleets, it's much harder. So why have they stuck to that in Australia? Sydney Hobart couldn't, couldn't say, I'll, I'll have to ask some friends down there. Um, and get a feeling, and Ed may well be right. Uh, it, it's also, you know, you know that Rorsi, who essentially is the IRC in large measure, Rorsi um, runs its regattas IRC, and they run some of the world's um, most popular and most competitive regattas. So it's natural that they're choosing their own rule. Okay, we are six minutes over time. Um, is there anything left in the Q&A here? Um, I don't see any. Time for one more question if there is one. I think we're, I think we're done. Um, thank you, everyone, then, for attending. Thank you, and the ticker, yeah. The, your time with the, us. The uh, participant ticker is going down now. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tim Hill, for sticking with us. That was very gracious of you there at New York Yacht Club. Um, thank you, Chris and Larry. Um, thanks to Kate Summers, um, who does media for Storm Trisol for putting that PDF together. We will distribute that and everyone will have access to the recordings and a link to the April 10th session. So um, thanks, everybody, um, and good evening. Mm -hmm.